Silicon Valley has become such a metaphor for innovation that it's hard to imagine a world in which it never came about. If we clipped the valley out of the US, it would be the 19th wealthiest country in the world on its own. Yet it didn't have to happen. Silicon Valley is the product of a surprising chain of coincidences, obscure regulatory tweaks, and what happens when you concentrate brilliant and eccentric people in one location and give them a rather peculiar set of incentives. Building Tomorrow is going to explore that birth, the birth of Silicon Valley, both what that has meant for innovation today and how that past reveals the ways that the future of Silicon Valley and innovation in America more broadly is under threat. To introduce the first pillar of Silicon Valley, let's start by thinking about how many people live on this warm blue marble that we call Earth. There are 7.7 billion of us, which is just over 23 times as many people as roughly 230 million people who live in the United States. And given that genius and talent are going to have a rather naturally broad geographic distribution, even if opportunity does not, we simply can't expect one nation to dominate technological innovation for as long as Silicon Valley has, for perhaps half a century, all on its own. And sure enough, that's not what happened. Silicon Valley might be in America, but it was built by some of the brightest minds both from here and from around the globe. To quote a little Broadway, immigrants, we get the job done. It's hard to communicate just how vital immigrants are to the Silicon Valley economy. Fully 57% of tech workers with a college degree were born abroad. And it's actually closer to three quarters if you look just at Palo Alto. And they aren't just working for other people. Researcher Ian Hathaway over at the Brookings Think Tank notes, Though accounting for less than 14% of the population, immigrants found almost a quarter of all new businesses, nearly one-third of venture-backed companies, and half of Silicon Valley high-tech startups. More than half of all Nobel Prize winners were born abroad. And get this, if you list the countries that have the most patents awarded to immigrant inventors, the U.S. has more than the next 26 countries combined. Now, for more about the role of immigrants in the innovation economy, I sat down with Alex Narasta, who's the Director of Immigration Studies here at the Cato Institute. So if you had to classify American immigration policy in comparison to international immigration policies, where would you situate us in compared to other nations? We let in comparatively fewer immigrants as a percentage of our population than most other OECD countries. And of that population we let in, it is uh, disproportionately those who are family members of American citizens and other lawful permanent residents, whereas a lot of other countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, just to give some examples, allowing comparatively more higher skilled immigrants who are more likely to be higher educated, et cetera, uh, than the United States does. So we have a more family-focused system. Most of the rest of the world has a system that tries to identify skilled workers and allow them in. Uh, for my research, this appears to have like two – there are two ways in which this flow of immigrants post-65 play an important role in the rise of Silicon Valley. And it's both to provide – um, kind of unskilled labor, like the f folks who work on factory lines um, in, in California factories. Um, it, it's, a, it's a relatively cheap source of labor to build stuff, to build the products. But then there's a high-skilled um, kind of a conduit for high-skilled labor to come, the, the kind of people who are, who are founding startups, who are engineers, software programmers, um, the innovators and in startup and uh, that scene as well. And so in combination – you really it's hard to imagine Silicon Valley without those two flows of 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 immigrants. Um, how how do you see that that playing a role in the rise of Silicon Valley? So I think it plays a very large role. Um, just to back up and sort of take like a thirty five thousand foot view, um, the U.S. population is only about four point four percent of the world's population. But it disproportionately produces uh, innovations, technology, a lot of these new things. And Silicon Valley is the hub of that. So it would be quite a coincidence if uh, all of those people who are the most innovative and productive in the world come from a subpopulation that's only 4.4% of the world's population, right? So these productive areas, whether it's in finance in New York – whether it's um, uh, fashion in London and Northern Italy or the movie industry in L.A. or if it's technology in Silicon Valley, disproportionately foreign-born. 
just because the talent pool globally, um, there aren't nearly as many hyper-talented people as there are the rest of us. So they need to be able to go to these hubs, these clusters, where people are able to innovate and work together to produce uh, these uh, amazing innovations that we all take for granted. So these people basically self-select. They're driven by market forces. They also have to go to these areas like Silicon Valley where there's a lot of innovation. And they have had a tremendously important uh, impact on this. Um, you know, Economists struggle with understanding what causes innovation. We don't really know uh, what that is. Uh, we don't even know what causes economic growth really. Uh, it's sort of a big mystery about it. Um, but a couple of the different theories about where innovation comes from, where economic growth comes from, Basically means like making things more efficient, like getting more products out of fewer resources, fewer imports, inputs, as well as like entirely new leaps and ways of doing things. So this could come from, you know, more entrepreneurs founding new companies that are taking big risks from increased patents, uh, more profitable firms as, as a result of both of these things, more business creation, uh, new creation of products. And immigration has a big impact on all these things. So what's interesting, just to give you an example of like entrepreneurship, um, which is sort of one measure of, of potential innovation anyway, is uh, immigrants in the United States are one third more likely to self uh, own their own businesses. Uh, they are twice as likely to start any new business in any new year compared to native born uh, Americans. Um, basically, they patent at double the rate of native born Americans over the 1940 to 2000 time period. Um, and over other time periods that we have information for. Um, their businesses tend to be a little bit more profitable when they find them. And uh, a lot of times they are concentrated in industries that create new products. Now, none of those are a perfect measure of innovation. None of them are a perfect measure of economic growth, of course. But all of the ones that people talk about as being potential sources, immigrants are overrepresented. My understanding for a lot of skilled workers in the US, they came up coming on something called the H-1B visa, what is that? When did it start? How does that work? So the H-1B is a temporary low-skill guest worker visa program for specialty workers and high-skilled occupations. Uh, it also includes supermodels and some other people like that, but um, that accounts for like less than 1% of them. Basically, you have to have a wage of $60,000, uh, have a job offered by an American firm, and it started in the early 1990s as part of the Immigration Act of 1990. It went into effect a few years later. It allows... Um, uh, 65,000 annually uh, to work in American firms and an additional 20,000 who are graduates of American universities, uh, especially like um, uh, graduate schools in the United States. So it's effectively 85,000 per year for for-profit firms. Um, there's an unlimited number for um, nonprofit research institutions. So you and I are actually uh, very exposed to competition from uh, foreign-born high-skilled workers, much more so than any for-profit company actually in the United States on this. Um, so the H-1B is a tremendous way in which folks from abroad or those educated in American universities can work and live in the United States. Rarely amongst U.S. visas, they can also adjust their status, which means they're on one visa, they can get another visa uh, without leaving the country. So they can be sponsored by their employers for a green card while they are working in the United States. Uh, but those green cards are very regulated. They're highly limited in terms of numbers. Um, the wait time for Indians for one of the variety of green cards is over a century. So that's not like a great advantage. Uh, to it, but H-1Bs are the way that a lot of folks, especially South Asians and East Asians, are able to get into that green card category because it's expensive to sponsor somebody for a green card. It's you know ten to thirty five thousand dollars in government and legal fees to do that. Most firms, understandably, want to basically take try out the worker on an H-1B before they invest this amount of money in um, in hiring that person uh, and sponsoring them for a green card. So the H-1B visa is basically a way to try that. The big problem with it today is that there are – nobody knows how many H-1Bs are currently employed in the United States, but it's – hundreds of thousands um, in for-profit firms, uh, multiple hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as almost a million. And um, the green card wait time for some of them is uh, decades of centuries So because the green card numbers are so low. So you have a lot of people working on these visas that aren't the best visas in the world, by the way. It's difficult to change jobs. They can, but it's difficult. It's expensive. And if they 
basically lose their jobs and they are deportable um, almost immediately. So it's not the best visa in the world. So as a result, you have a lot of these problems that occur because of it, uh, because of these regulations that make it difficult to change jobs, difficult to move, and because of the lack of a green cards. So it's not the best situation. So let's say, I mean, I suspect that you, like us here at Building Tomorrow, generally favor uh, opening the borders much more than they currently are restricted. But let's say you had to pick, like, we can't have everything we want you know, uh, the amount of political capital to be spent is finite. We can only change some relatively discrete things. What are two or three immigration policy changes um, that you would pick that would like maintain the flow of talent that has made America kind of a hub for economic growth and innovation? If you're forced to choose, what are your top two or three? If we're focusing on like high skilled, I would say the one thing we definitely need is an entrepreneurship visa. We don't have one. Okay. So the so, H-1B doesn't count as an entrepreneurship visa? No, you can't start a business on an H-1B. You can't like sponsor yourself if you're the business creator to do that. So what we need is a visa or a way for people who are here on other visas to basically say like, if you want to start a firm, give it a shot, make it really easy. That seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah. Really simple, low-hanging fruit. Uh, the second way would be just to build within the current system and, say, increase the number of employment-based green cards by, say, um, a factor of 10. <laughs> or or just make it so that we don't have numerical caps, but just if there's an American firm that wants to hire you and you're highly skilled, then they can do it. And maybe charge a price, $1,000 couple thousand dollars in government fees to do that. That's sort of not crazy radical. Um, you know, I prefer that they don't have to charge a price at all. But, you know, thinking about the political possibilities, make them charge a price so that we at least like give an incentive for them to go out of their way a little bit to try to hire Americans. That might be politically uh, feasible to do. Um, those seem like two, um, two very good ways to do it. Um, and then... Um, Within the combination of this, I think we need more experimentation with um, temporary visas. So Senator Ron Johnson introduced a bill in 2013 uh, – sorry, 2017 um, that would create a state-based pilot program which allows states to create their own temporary guest worker programs. And I think a lot of states would create an experiment with um, like higher skilled visas and entrepreneurship visas and investor visas. And I think that allowing that, putting that off into the states with some experimentation would be a wonderful way to figure out what types of visas work best or at least what work best in different regions in the United States. So I think the combination of those three types of visas – would be basically what we need to um, to, to do it. Oh, and sorry, sorry, one other one that's super easy. Um, anybody who graduates from an American university with a uh, college degree or advanced degree should basically have like a green card stapled um, to their diploma. This actually introduces a, a subject I wanted to talk a little bit about here, uh, with the student visa system. And my understanding is that it has been a you know American universities are you know they populate the list of the top universities in the world. There's a reason why so so many folks come to the U.S. to study to get both college degrees and advanced degrees, graduate degrees. I mean, I, when I was at Penn State, it was close to half. It might have been over half of all graduate students um, were were immigrants or were you know, here temporarily at least. Um, especially in the science and engineering in the STEM departments. But that system has always been kind of cobbled together. It, it, it doesn't feel like it was designed with a lot of forethought. And then it's been under pressure from the Trump administration. So can you talk about our, our student visa system? Yeah. So the F visa is a student visa and it allows you to attend a U.S. Uh, university. Now, the reason why the student visa is popular is because it's the United States and because people also want a chance of staying in the United States. Okay. And you can get an F visa. You can get an H-1B off of that. You can get something called OPT, which is a temporary work for I believe it's up to 36 months in the United States without a H-1B visa in science, technology, engineering, and other, other fields like that. So there are avenues to actually work in the United States and if you get an H-1B, potentially a green card permanently. So you have to take a look at that, right? Like it's not just the value of coming to an American educational institution, which is, you know, valuable and whatever, but a lot of it is socially wasteful signaling. Yeah, but it's a foot in the door and that's what they're paying for. Um, that's what's very valuable. 
Um, so a lot of these people, of course, are very smart. You have to be smart and intelligent and hardworking to get into these universities in the first place. But this is a way in. So nobody really designed the F visa to be this like foot in the door to come in and potentially stay in the United States. Uh, but that is what it's become. The Trump administration has been putting more restrictions on this, basically making it more difficult for folks to prove that they have a uh, student visa to go through the interview process. You have to be interviewed abroad. You have to travel to a consulate or U.S. embassy to do the interviews. They're basically making so you have to do more interviews. There's more paperwork that needs to be filled out. And that's just expensive for a lot of students, especially from poorer countries who aren't that well off to begin with. Uh, A lot of these students are well off. Um, You know, we're not getting the poorest people from India who are coming in on H-1B. It's people who are fairly well off in those places. Um, uh, generally at, at least above the median in terms of uh, of income and education, or at least their parents are. But it does make it more expensive. If you have to travel across the country to go to a consulate, do interviews, um, et cetera, uh, basically hire a lawyer, go through this entire process without a guarantee of getting a student visa, that raises the uncertainty. So a lot more folks are going to European universities now. They're going to Canadian, Australian universities, New Zealand uh, Etc. Um, I don't think this is going to like kill American universities uh, unless it continues for a long time. But this is a heck of a source of revenue for them because these students, you know, they don't pay any in-state tuition. They pay higher tuition because they're foreign. On top of all the fees and other things that they have to pay to the university and to the U.S. government, so it's quite expensive for them to come in on uh, the first place, and those extra fees subsidize a lot of scholarships for American students who are a little bit poorer or worse off who are trying to uh, be educated at these universities. It also um, lowers, um, you know, foreign-born students are more likely to patent when they're at universities. So by blocking them a lot of, you know, universities lose out on patents, potential patents, and in the long run, uh, potential donors uh, to their universities. Like, I don't weep that much for universities because I pay a lot to go to university and I'm never going to write a check. But a lot of them are going to uh, to lose out on this and they have a very valuable product that they want to be able to sell. And the U.S. government is basically getting in the way of U.S. educational exports. And I thought this administration loved exports, so I don't understand um, what the big deal is. And I thought they loved merit-based immigration, but no, they they don't. That's just a talking point. So highly skilled immigrants primarily increase productivity through boosting innovation, uh, the number of patents, and a lot of business startups. So new innovations, patents, and businesses generate new ideas, and these advance the technological frontier Enhance productivity, increase a lot of our human knowledge. So although it's difficult to measure productivity enhancing innovations directly, patenting rates probably come pretty close, right? They're probably associated with higher productivity at the country and sector level. So they're like not the worst proxy measurement out there. So they're pretty decent, I think, for what we're talking about. So in the U.S., citizens of foreign countries file at least a quarter of all patents at perhaps as many as 30% since 1976, but they are currently only about 13% of the U.S. population. Immigrants patent at double the rate of native-born Americans due to their disproportionately holding science and engineering degrees. So for instance, uh, two economists, Hunt and Gautier Losel, uh, in 2010, found that a one percentage point increase in immigrant college graduates' population share increased patents by 9 to 18%. So a very dramatic uh, result uh, increase in that. The result of this was that an increase in patents per capita by 12 to 21% in a period where the total number of patents per capita rose by 63%. So basically, immigration and immigrant patenters, patentees uh, accounted for about a fifth to a third of all the new per capita patent increase in the United States from 1940 to 2000. Clearly, Silicon Valley would be a shell of itself were it not for the wave of immigrants that came to the U.S. starting in the mid-1960s. Maybe you're asking, why then? Well, what's striking about the timing is that who actually came post-1965 was a bit of a legislative accident that has had immense, unintended, salutary consequences. But first, let me briefly explain the immigration landscape before the 1960s. Now, if you go all the way back to the founding, immigration restrictions were, of course, essentially impossible prior to the mid-19th century. The federal government was too small, borders were too porous to effectively control. So for the first century of U.S. history, we effectively had open borders. But with the growth of federal bureaucracy and the rise of pseudoscientific racism, interest in excluding immigrants from quote-unquote undesirable countries grew apace. 
the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882 explicitly banned all immigration from China. Now, immigration restrictionism, which would kind of culminate in the next 40 years in the Immigration Act of 1924, Nativists wanted to stem the southern and eastern European tide coming into the United States. That meant Italians, Greeks, Slavs, really all non-Protestants. They were just beyond the pale. Then, with the backing of progressive eugenicists and the conservative Second Ku Klux Klan, Congress passed a new system of immigration quotas based on nationality, effectively closing the door on all but a trickle of legal immigrants. But then, during the height of the Cold War, Congress realized that the lack of skilled immigrants was hurting the U.S. in the space race with the Soviet Union. So, thinking that lifting the national quota system would lead to more German scientists and English doctors coming to the U.S., Congress passed the Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965. Now, if they'd known the effects of the bill, congressional Democrats who were beholden to labor unions, they wouldn't have passed it. Indeed, President Lyndon Johnson in his signing statement said, quote, This bill that we will sign today, it's not a revolutionary bill. It does not affect the lives of millions. It will not reshape the structure of our daily lives or really add importantly to either our wealth or our power. LBJ couldn't have been more wrong. It's a testament to the power of free labor markets that repealing the national quota system played such an important part in unleashing incredible and unexpected innovation and prosperity. One of the immediate consequences of the reform was an influx of skilled workers from all over the globe, not just from Western Europe like its authors thought. Congress at the time was comfortable imagining more white immigrants from developed countries, but what they got instead was a flood of skilled, educated, driven immigrants from China, India, South Korea, and Africa. To give you just one concrete example, in 1965, and this is before the bill went into effect, only 47 scientists and engineers could legally immigrate to the U.S. from Taiwan. Just 47. Two years later, that number was 1,321. That's 28 times more in just two years. And the numbers kept growing rapidly. While it's impossible to imagine Silicon Valley without these immigrants, it's worth remembering that there are still high-skilled immigrants being turned away every year. That's because the 1965 reforms it primarily increased family-based immigration, but there are still caps in the numbers of visas for skilled workers who don't have family in the U.S. These visas are called H-1B visas, which allows corporations to sponsor immigrants with in-demand skills. However, most years, two to three times as many people and corporations apply for those visas as the number allotted, leaving thousands of engineers, doctors, and the like on the outside looking in. This is particularly egregious given that it's estimated the U.S. faces a two million person deficit in the number of engineers our economy needs by 2022. That means research projects not pursued, innovation lying fallow, and products not released. And the H-1B visa system is particularly damaging for innovation in the most cutting edge technological fields like artificial intelligence and quantum computing research. To explain why, I've asked Caleb Watney, a research fellow at the R Street Institute, to join me. So, Caleb, you've described before uh, one of the unintended consequences of how the H-1B1 visa system works. And it, it, my understanding is that it tends to actually increase consolidation in the technology industry. What do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. Um, so... I think it's important to just take a step back first and realize that for a lot of emerging technologies, um, but AI, but also you know biotech and lots of other areas, um, access to high skill human capital, human talent, is incredibly important, and it's really the uh, the biggest bottleneck right now to uh, AI progress. Not only between countries when you're looking at you know how's the U.S. comparing to China, but also for specific companies you know that are trying to compete against each other. Uh, access to high skill talent talent is hugely important. And for uh, something like AI or machine learning, you're seeing uh, a huge demand short or supply shortfall. Demand for these skills is far outstripping the available talent, both in terms of the absolute number that we have and also the number that are being 
produced or you know created through uh, U.S. universities, especially. There's only so many people in the world who have the level of expertise. I mean, these are cutting edge and remarkably complicated fields, like whether Absolutely. it's it's artificial intelligence or uh, quantum computing or yep. whatnot. Yeah, and we're not talking about you know just run of the mill you know computer scientists. Yeah, these are really yep. the top of the top. Uh, you know, people that are in you know top machine learning PhDs. And there uh, for... may be a few dozen, a few hundred of them in the world capable of really advancing this work at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, numbers trying to quantify yeah, this sure, population okay. is very difficult. But uh, as, you know, a rough proxy, we could look at the number of, you know, uh, machine learning and related subfields uh, for PhD and master's students, right? Mm -hmm. And of that population, we're seeing roughly 70% of those students are international students. So really, the the majority uh, of the supply that's being created every year um, of new machine learning, um, you know, talented, skilled uh, engineers are international students, which then means that the immigration system, um, specifically, as you mentioned, the H-1B visa, uh, which is the primary pathway through which a lot of these students can stay in the United States long term, uh, the way that that system is set up uh, really ends up inadvertently shaping the distribution of where that talent ends up going. Uh, in the United States. So on one hand, I mean, the, the most the, kind of the simplest or most straightforward problem is that there's only so many H-1B1 visas to go around um, and there are, there is going to be talent left out because of that. People who, who wanted to immigrate, who would be working at a startup company or at a, a tech firm and cannot just because the, the pool of H-1B1 visas was uh, yeah. was filled early in the year. Um, and, and I think people get that. That's a fairly straightforward problem. And it's a real problem. It's a reason to increase the number of H-1P1 visas. But my understanding is that there's a second problem that I don't think is quite so obvious uh, to observers. Yep. What's that problem? Yeah, so that's basically, uh, you know, completely at, uh Beside the question of how many of these students or how many of these, these visas we have is uh, what's the process for uh, applying to have one of these visas in the first place and how does that end up shaping where this talent goes? Um, so we can see if you look at, uh, you know, ex ante career interests uh, for a lot of these international students, they actually report a higher desire to uh, want to work at a startup or a small company than a uh, you know, otherwise equivalent United States students uh, in that program. Uh, but in actuality, these students are way more likely, almost twice as likely, more, like, uh, more likely to end up working at a big incumbent firm, whether that be Google, Facebook, Amazon. Um, and the biggest reason for that is uh, essentially immigration hurdles. Uh, so if you are applying to have an H-1B visa, um, it's really helpful to have a huge HR department that's capable of braving the immigration bureaucracy. You have to have immigration lawyers on staff. There are very expensive fees. Um, the timeline, the complexity, all of this makes it very difficult for startups to be able to actually apply to have access for this you know, really high-skill talent versus big companies have basically specialized yeah. in having this. Um, and so you can not only see sort of that, that difference between um, both – what's the career ex-ante interests of these students and where do they end up. But also, uh, there's been recent empirical work that uh, looks at what are the outcomes of startups that do end up having access to this talent. So the H-1B visa, because it's uh, primarily a lottery system, uh, it's random, which, uh, you know, as a good economist looking yeah, for experimental great. design, that's great. <laughs> you know, you, ha you have a natural experiment right there. And so you can see uh, what is sort of the difference between startups that do complete randomness, luck, and, you know, no other factor. It's, it's isolating out everything else with that randomness, um, those that just happen to get more lucky in actually getting the talent that they, they're applying to get um, through the H-1B visa lottery, um, what happens to those that, that do end up getting more lucky? And so you can see um, a one standard deviation increase in the visa win rate, basically you know companies that are luckier than average in terms of having access to this talent, uh, they end up having, or it's correlated with a 20% increase in the likelihood of getting a major funding deal, another 20% increase in the likelihood of successfully IPOing, of being successfully acquired. There's an increase in the number of successful patent applications that are filed. Across a whole broad range of metrics, you can see that startups that just, again, through complete luck, happen to have ac better access to this talent end up being much more successful than companies that don't. And so I think this combination of 
looking at the the ex ante career interests and seeing the big mismatch there, um, and combined with these cool new empirical results, indicate that we we do have a sort of an entrepreneurial uh, talent that we could be unleashing in the United States. You know, talent that would like to go create startups or or work for a small startup, but currently cannot. Um, and so I think, especially as we're we're talking about you know competition issues in the United States, um, and you know, our Google, Facebook, Amazon too big. I think a, a side question is, what is preventing small companies from competing against them? And I think uh, this talent issue uh, seems to be a very big deal. So this intersects, like you mentioned, with the antitrust, the you know, um, um, corporate consolidation uh, conversation, mm-hmm. um, which, which is a legitimate concern. I mean, I, I don't think you know there can be a temptation for a kind of vulgar um, libertarianism to say, well, it's it's a you know. React reactively pro corporate. Anything a corporation yeah. does is is good. Mm-hmm. Ergo, but like no, like if if we ha- what we're talking about here is a form of unintentional. I, I don't think the companies the, the companies didn't have any role in designing the H one B visa program. But it's almost the kind of they're the beneficiaries of an arbitrary government process that is creating a competitive emo- moat around them. It's you know, in a sense, a kind of indirect regulatory capture uh, or something. I, it, and and uh, we, we should have a problem with that on um, antitrust consolidation competition issues. And here, potentially, I suppose there's common cause with folks who come from a different kind of ideological or political perspective who might have different reasons for being concerned about um, uh, antitrust and consolidation. But we can all kind of agree this is an example of it that folks from across the political spectrum can can kind of work together on. Absolutely. I think both sides of the aisle, regardless of where you kind of fall on the antitrust issue, uh, I, I hope that the goal is a competitive equilibrium, basically. You know, uh, we don't want incumbents to be winning just because they're incumbents. We want, you know, more innovation, more consumer welfare, lower prices, you know, a whole host of things we care about. And also, you know, good work conditions for, for the workers. And uh yeah, the, the competitive equilibrium is, is really what we care about. And I, I think you're right that sometimes libertarians and free market folk can kind of look at the current equilibrium, assume that it's competitive because, you know, we are broadly, uh, you know, a market-based system here in the United States and assume that that must be the effect of the competitive equilibrium. And it may be. I don't want to say that if we made this change tomorrow, Google and Facebook and Amazon <laughs> would come collapsing down, right? Yeah. Uh, it may be that, you know, they, they really are uh, the, the most efficient use of, of the capital, but – or sorry, of this human capital. But we want to check that. We want to make sure, right? Yeah. Uh, it could be that the reason they are so much more successful is because they have this unequal access to this very important human capital. And so, uh, yeah, I hope that, that both sides can come together and say, hey, look, here seems to be a very obvious example of a way in which the market is not efficient right now. Uh, human capital is not being allocated to its, its highest valued use. So let's fix that. But so we have this one kind of angle, the consolidation you know, competitive equilibrium approach. But there's also a downside from just the pure innovation perspective, which is, I mean, I think there is a pretty robust literature suggesting that uh, larger incumbent firms um, are more likely to, uh, now they're not less likely to develop new technology. Like they often have in-house R&D outfits, skunk works, et cetera. But there is a long track record of big incumbent firms uh, slow, slow rolling or even sitting on technological innovation um, because it challenges, it disrupts their current market model. I mean, the infamous examples are pre-digital. You think of like a Kodak sitting on the digital camera for two decades functionally, uh, which they developed in-house. So it's not that they weren't doing innovation. Yeah. They weren't going to roll it out, however. So if this, is, if, if this is a problem, if the top minds in AI and in quantum computing, et cetera, are flocking to incumbent firms because of a quirk of the, the visa system, this comes at a penalty for innovation that's so it's not just about the particular companies yep. it's about stymieing innovation across the entire tech economy yeah no that that's a great point i think especially with the way that you know the ai field in particular is working you're seeing a lot of the top breakthroughs are coming from these top companies you know uh whether it be google deepmind or uh open ai or you know other uh larger firms that have you know deep established uh research labs and can spend lots and lots of money and again have lots of immigration lawyers on staff yeah, that can help right, break right. this system um and it might be that uh, you know there is a certain economy of scale that's required to kind of be making these breakthroughs but I think it's sometimes difficult to know the full impact of startups. I, I think startups play a useful role in the ecosystem, uh, kind of regardless of whether or not you're actually seeing the top innovations happen through there, uh, because they, they sort of correct for some incentives. So uh, 
big incumbent firms, it's very easy for them to kind of get bogged down uh, in particular management structures and also in particular technological architectures, right? Uh, you can continue building up everything on a certain platform that maybe is no longer the best way to to be building a certain application. And startups can kind of come in and if you're thinking about creative destruction, right, sometimes uh, path dependence in technology and in management structures can end up leading to inefficient outcomes continuing to, to maintain. Uh, startups maybe are almost like a, you know, a dissolution, uh, you know, they, they basically can dissolve some of this path dependence that, that forces technology onto inefficient paths for a long term and help it actually, you know, more quickly correct to what the the more efficient path is, right? Because they, they are much more flexible, they're leaner, they can try out new uh, both structures in terms of how should, should firms be organized and also new technologies, you know, whether, um, you know, a more decentralized approach to, uh, you know, quantum computing or something, you know, you know might be better uh, that's much more difficult for a big company to experiment with. And so you either get the outcome of then that startup based on this this new change or this new twerk, uh, tweak out competes the, the incumbent firm and that's great. Or alternatively, maybe that forces the incumbent firm to be more innovative and forward looking in terms of how things might respond uh, regardless. You know, this sort of gets back to um, – uh, Schumpeter, the economist, in his uh, you know essay when he's describing creative destruction, says even if it may look like there's not any competition, so long as it is a competitive dynamic, right? The the incumbent always has the threat of being outcompeted by a small firm that forces them to behave as if they were under perfect competition in some sense, you know. And so I think, uh, it, yeah, it, it goes back to again making sure that we have a competitive equilibrium, and that if these incumbents are in fact uh, you know building out inefficient technologies or inefficient management structures, that they can be competed away. Um, and again, I think startups play an important role in that regard. So you meant seventy percent of kind of global AI talent coming out of you know universities uh, comes from abroad, right? Where is that coming from in particular? What, what's the national origin of that seventy percent? Yeah, it's it's pretty varied, but the two biggest um, sources are China and India. Um, you're seeing, you know, a pretty big focus in in those countries on acquiring technical skills, and then um, I think both for actual like human capital development, like U.S. universities just tend to be like really really good. Uh, you know, Chinese universities are trying to to make strides and start matching that. Um, but I think also for signaling reasons, you know, there's just a, like a lot of prestige that comes from from going to U.S. universities. Um, and so in some sense, our greatest export uh, on some level is the prestige of our U.S. university system that then attracts all of the world's uh, greatest minds. It, 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 there's a really good book um, called The Gift of Global Talent, which kind of talks about uh, over the decades, you know, over the, you know, basically the 20th century, uh, where did all of the innovators and uh you know, inventors end up going. And so he looks at the the category of people that have at least one patent application, um, you know, in the United States or otherwise, uh, and sort of net immigrators versus net emigrators. So which countries had more of this population leaving than coming and which had more coming than leaving. And Almost like every single country is a net emigrator except for the United States, which is just this <laughs> okay. massive immigrator. Like yeah. So many people of, of this population are coming here. Um, and I think that's both because um, – you know, innovation clusters form and they're very sticky and you want to be around, uh, you know, networks with other venture capitalists and other startup founders and whatnot. And so that's like a huge draw. But I think the other part is our, our university system, which is, uh, yeah, a great way in for a lot of, uh, you know, really smart, talented uh, entrepreneurial people. And the fact that we don't have an easier pathway for them to stay in the United States is, is a huge problem. It's really the United States is like superpower as a country yeah. is the fact that we have this huge natural advantage. And so then it's it's kind of bizarre that we're not <laughs> taking full advantage I of know, it. Right. Yeah. At times it's almost insane. In spite of our poll, in really spite is, of ourselves, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the the fact that our you know innovation clusters are so strong is yeah certainly not due to robust federal support or you know policy accommodating. That's yeah, it is in spite of that. I, I think the the other factor here though is uh, aside from the H one B visa, the other thing I want to point out is that um, unlike other countries, um, Canada and Australia come to mind. We don't have a startup visa, mm -hmm. so on an H one B visa, you can work for a startup. Um, you can be a worker, but it's very difficult structurally to be a startup founder mm -hmm. or, or a co-founder in the United States. Um, there's, I, you know, I think some provision with the H-1B that you have to be like a fireable employee, which is difficult to do if you're the founder of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, that that leads to, uh, you know, I think people then working at incumbent firms for long enough that maybe then they can get a green card and then they can start a company or something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so it's, again, another, another inefficiency. And so... Uh, or I suppose we risk they work for Facebook as an engineer for a while while accrue the skills, connections to venture capital necessary, et cetera, 
and then go back and start the company back in China or India. Yeah, that too. Or, yeah. You're seeing uh, China especially has been very aggressively trying to recruit back students and entrepreneurs from the United States um, that are Chinese nationals and get them to come back to China. Uh, I mean, you hear you know pretty outrageous deals, you know, free equity, free financing, free room and board, uh, you know, almost anything you could need just as a way of trying to attract them back, saying, hey, we, we recognize you know our our equilibrium, our, our tech clusters aren't quite as good as in the United States yet, but but please come back, you know, we'll give you all these free things. I, I think sometimes there is an attitude that, you know, would push back on, say, you know, part of this is just like necessary. You have to, you know, vet immigrants to a certain amount. And there is just a certain amount of cost and complexity that is inevitable to the process. But you can, like, compare and say, what are U.S. like wait times yeah. and what are U.S. like processing fees and compare them to other, you know, Western industrialized countries and see the United States is much, you know, more expensive and much longer of a process than, uh, you know, some of these other countries like the U.K. and like Canada, um, which, yeah, seems like a, like a major problem. There there's uh, a force called innovation arbitrage that you know some of my colleagues have written about, uh, which is sort of the idea that in the same way uh, you know physical capital or, or money can you know flow across borders to the area where it's tax leased, uh, you're seeing innovation and entrepreneurs are kind of moving around to the areas where it's most open and most welcome. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes this takes the the place of whose regulations are the best, you know. So uh, drone testing for a while was shifting over to Canada, Australia, Switzerland, um, because they were much, those regulators were much more, much more accommodating than the FAA was here in the United States. But innovation, or sorry, uh, immigration is also a way in which uh, you can have this differentiation, especially for fields where uh, high skill human capital is so important for actually you know, creating the companies to begin with that it's becoming a major differentiator in terms of where you want to start your business in the first place. Given the current crunch on skilled labor, we should be having a conversation about increasing the number of immigrants legally allowed into the U.S., Instead, the Trump administration has been doing its damnedest to further restrict immigration across the board. Various proposals have been floated, and thankfully not yet enacted, to shrink the H-1B visa program and end chain migration, thus attacking the two key elements of the 1965 immigration reform. On the issue of student visas, which is a key pipeline for tech companies, what happens is STEM graduates, they come to study, then they stay permanently after graduation. Well, on student visas, the Trump administration, they can act without congressional approval by executive authority, decreasing the number of visas granted to foreign college students. They've done so by about a quarter since Trump took office, with greater decreases expected this year or next. To put that in hard numbers, that's more than 100,000 fewer students, many of whom once would have stayed in the U.S. to work at tech companies. Put that in context, there are 87 $1 billion startups, known colloquially as unicorns, in the U.S. Given that a quarter of those were founded specifically by an immigrant who first came to America as an international student, we're going to feel the impact of these restrictions for decades to come in lost innovation and economic growth. It's, it's really a rather incredible self-own. Think about the continuing ramifications of that impact on immigrant communities. It makes engineers and programmers reconsider whether this is actually a stable, welcoming country. When political leaders indicate that not only will they, these naturalized immigrants, not be fully accepted as fully American, but that even their children, simply because of brown or black skin, might be told to go back where they came from, as Donald Trump did to several members of Congress, well, I can guarantee you that leads to conversations going on in the homes of hundreds of thousands of skilled immigrants across the country. We've made a generation of engineers and entrepreneurs wonder if they should avoid America and apply instead for a visa in, say, Toronto's growing Maple Valley tech hub, or find a position in Singapore, Shenzhen, Dubai, Stockholm, etc., a more welcoming and also pro-tech place. We so desperately need immigrants to remind us that our future is not fixed in stone. And yet, our ill-considered policies are pushing immigrants to consider settling in other countries. I already mentioned Toronto, Canada, which has been nicknamed Maple Valley, and actually even more precious than that nickname. Instead of calling $1 billion startups unicorns like we do in Silicon Valley, they're calling them narwhals after the single horn sea creature, which I love. In direct contrast to the US, Canada has opened its arms to immigrants who comprise fully 20% of the national population versus 14% in the US. Last Year, they reformed their version of the H-1B visa so that it's uncapped, meaning that you can apply for it and receive it in as little as two weeks 
whereas it can take years to get the comparable visa in the U.S. It also allows your spouse to find work as well. It doesn't lock you into working for a single sponsor company like the U.S. version. It is better. As one Torontoan entrepreneur put it, quote, the brand of America as the land of the free and the place of opportunity has really taken a hit. It's no longer the default go-to place for people who have world-class talent. There's a chill going on south of the border. Right now, we're positioning ourselves to be a lot more welcoming, end quote. That welcoming attitude is rapidly paying off. Toronto has added more tech jobs over the last five years than Silicon Valley and Seattle and D.C. combined. Canadian venture capital is still small, but with a much faster growth rate than Silicon Valley, from just $300 million in 2013 to $3.5 billion in 2018, 10x in a decade. Tech companies, including Microsoft, Uber, Intel, Google, NVIDIA, and Shopify, are opening new headquarters in Toronto. And I could do similar vignettes for dozens of emerging tech hubs around the world, from Shenzhen to Singapore. And we, as people who are loyal to concepts like liberty and free markets, can take heart from those examples. This is globalization at its best. We've reached a global tipping point where the future of technological innovation does not depend on any one location. Cities and countries around the world are competing for the best and the brightest minds. If one country adopts short-sighted anti-innovation policies, another will take advantage of the opening. But while my ultimate interest in technological innovation is that I believe it's the best means of propelling prosperity and liberty for all of humankind, I am still an American. I want my native home to be as large a part of that success story as it can be. And I do think we have something important to add. So what should we pro-innovation folks do beyond resisting the immigration restrictionist madness? Well, I'm an immigration maximalist myself, but even if you're not, we should be able to agree that restrictions on skilled immigrants are self-defeating. Extend more student and H-1B visas at a minimum. We should also seriously consider the ideas of economists like Gary Becker, Pio Arrhenius, and Madeleine Zavodny for some kind of green card auction, which would itself undermine the inaccurate nativist rhetoric about immigrants as takers, could even fund you know, border control and some kind of grand compromise. Legalize dreamers who own 86% of fast growth Latina immigrant owned businesses. There are concrete steps and policies that we can push for that will ensure the future of America's part in the global innovation economy. That's the importance of immigration to the birth of Silicon Valley and the future of the global economy. In two weeks, we'll return with the second pillar for the birth of Silicon Valley. And until then, be well. Thanks for listening. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Building Tomorrow, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.